I'm very happy to be here at the Mises Institute. And I'd also like to uh, thank Dr. Don Prince for sponsoring my talk. Uh, uh, Don is a great benefactor of the Mises Institute and also a, a physician who's leading the fight for medical freedom. Uh, as some of you know, I very often like to begin my talks <clears throat> with a, a joke, but I found when I was uh, preparing for this talk that can be a bit dangerous. Uh, one of the, I'll be talking about uh, Louis von Mises' Epicurean ethics, and one of the Greek philosophers who was around at roughly the same period was the Stoic philosopher Chrysippus. And according to one account, uh, Chrysippus told a joke that he thought was so funny, he laughed himself to death. <laughs> and the joke wasn't even funny. It had to do with, uh, <clears throat> with I'm not going to tell, it had to do with a, a goat drinking a glass of milk. I mean, it certainly doesn't sound like something you'd laugh yourself to death about, but <laughs> he, he managed to do it. Uh, <clears throat> these days, uh, Stoicism is very fashionable, and popular books on the subject are easy to find. Uh, <coughs> Ludwig von Mises drew from a different tradition of Greek ethics, Epicureanism. It, Mises saw in Epicurus, a philosopher who lived shortly after Aristotle, so Aristotle lived in the, this would be the fourth century BC, so that's the period we're taught with, he flourished. So he saw in Epicur Epicurus the beginning of an approach to ethics that he took to be correct. Uh, in what follows, I won't be concentrating on the details of Epicurus's views, but rather on some points that Mises took from him. And I should say, I won't, uh, I won't be giving arguments either in favor or against Mises' views. I'm myself inclined to a more Rothbardian view than Mises', than Mises view, but I think his way of looking at ethics is a very interesting one. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about uh, what his view was. And uh, the most important point in Mises' ethics is that Mises maintains there are two ways of looking at ethics. Uh, one of these ways is that ethics is about how each person can satisfy his personal preferences. So in this view, ethics is saying, given that people have certain preferences, how can the person uh, obtain, uh, get, fulfill these preferences? How can he satisfy whatever preferences he has? And the other view is that there's an objective law that dictates what people ought to do. And Mises places almost all ethical systems, except for utilitarianism, which he sometimes calls eudaimonism, in this latter camp. So except for utilitarianism, which he, Mises thinks begins with Epicurus, all the other theories are ones that are telling you what you ought to do. And these systems, the ones he, in this camp, the, the, of the camp that is not his camp, include natural law ethics, divine command ethics, and Kantian ethics. And Kantian ethics 
uh, is probably the type he's most opposed to. Now, natural law ethics says that human, that human beings have a certain nature or essence that dictates what they ought to do. So they would be, uh, say, human beings uh, ought, have, ought to do such and such to lead a flourishing life. And in this type of natural law ethics, it isn't up to you whether you want to lead a flourishing life. That's what you ought to do regardless of whether you want to or not. Uh, divine command ethics says that God dictates rules that people are required to follow. So Mises, put, uh, this is in the, camp, again, is the camp he's opposed to. Now, somebody could hold, although this isn't a view Mises really deals with, that somebody could hold that uh, the way people could achieve their personal preferences is to do what God commands because uh, God has arranged things so that if we follow those preferences, then uh, if we follow his commands, we'll be able to get what we want. But that isn't a view he considers, but I think if he were presented with it, I think he would probably say that uh, the view, he would still say that in that case, you would be viewing the divine commands as means to satisfy your personal preferences, and that isn't usually what's meant by divine command ethics. Uh, uh, Kantian ethics says that just by thinking about reason, practical reason, there are certain moral imperatives, that's to say, things you are required to do. So these imperatives wouldn't be ones that are means to enable you to achieve some preference or goal of your own, but they would be ones that follow just from considering practical reason. Now, here is a passage from Mises' book, Socialism, that states his opinion. And as you'll see, it's quite emphatic. He says, of course, one cannot discuss this point with the ethical a priorist or the intuitionist. So an intuitionist would be another kind of view about ethics he rejects. The intuitionist would say that there are certain values or oughts that we just directly perceive to be good. We intuit them. We grasp that these are goods that or oughts that we ought to accept. So Mises says we, can't discuss, we cannot discuss this point with the ethical a priorist or the intuitionist. Those who uphold the moral as ultimate fact and who rule out scientific examination of its elements by referring to a transcendental origin will never be able to agree with those who are dragging down the concept of right into the dust of scientific analysis. And it's clear he's one of those who want to drag down the concept of right into the dust of scientific analysis. Ethical ideas of duty and conscience, conscience demand nothing less than the blindest submission. A priori ethics, claiming unconditional validity for its norms, approaches all earthly relations from the outside and aims at transmuting them into its own form with no concern whatever for the consequences. Fiat justitia pereat mundus, that means let justice be 
done though the world perish is its motto. And when it becomes honestly indignant about the eternally misunderstood plea, the end justifies the means that it is most sincere. So what Mises is saying there is only he thinks the, this maxim, the end justifies the means, is misunderstood because people think that means you can do all sorts of evil things. Uh, but he says this is not the way to understand it. It's just that the only thing that could uh, justify doing something is a goal or end that you have. Now, uh, here is another passage in which Mises contrasts an ethics based on satisfying one's preferences with an ethics of duty. Uh, this is from Epistemological Problems of Economics. Uh, the most troublesome misunderstandings with which the history of philosophical thought has been plagued concern the terms pleasure and pain. These misconceptions have been carried over into the literature of sociology and economics and caused harm there too. Uh, before the introduction of this pair of concepts, ethics was a doctrine of what ought to be. It sought to establish the goals that man should adopt. You see, again, this is the top view he supposed that ethics is telling you what goals you ought to have. The realization that man seeks satisfaction by acts both of commission and of omission open the only path that can lead to a science of human action. Uh, uh, to understand Mises' position on ethics, it's essential to bear in mind that he's a psychological hedonist, that by that he means that everyone is always motivated by pleasure and pain. This, is, comes, this view comes straight from Epicurus. So we're always seeking pleasure and we're always trying to avoid pain. You, you might object that this view is obviously false. Uh, don't we very frequently go on restrictive diets, exercise, study subjects that aren't fun, and so on, maybe come to this lecture. Uh, uh, how can Mises then claim that we're always motivated by pleasure if we do things that aren't pleasurable or sometimes we willingly undergo pain? Uh, Mises' answer is that even though we're motivated by pleasure and pain, it doesn't follow that we are motivated by what will give us the most pleasure or the least pain at a given moment. We can be motivated by our wish for the most pleasure or the least pain over a long period of time. Doing things that are unpleasant now can make us get more pleasure in the long run. For example, if you come to this lecture, you'll be able to pass the test that will be given right after, and you'll feel good because you'll pass the exam. Uh, now, another point essential to understanding Mises is that when he talks about pleasure and pain, this isn't confined to physical sensation. Mises is talking about whatever we prefer and whatever we are averse to. So he's saying we're always motivated by pleasure and pain in that sense, but we have a choice as to what the time period is in which we're trying to uh, get the most pleasure or the least pain. One, just as a side point, a point that could be raised is, do, when I say most pleasure or least pain, 
would that a course of action always lead to the same thing if someone has most trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain? They might not lead to the same thing, but uh, that, that's just a side point. Now, Mises says uh, on this, uh, with the point about felt uneasiness, uh, we call contentment or satisfaction that state of a human being which does not and cannot result in any action. Uh, acting man is eager to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory. His mind imagines conditions which suit him better and his action aims at bringing about the desired state. The incentive that impels a man to act is always some uneasiness. A man perfectly content with the state of his affairs would have no incentive to change things. He would have neither wishes nor desires. He would be perfectly happy. He would not act. He would simply live free from care. So Mises here is taking over a view that Epicurus had, which was, we're always trying to act to get pleasure, but we're aiming for a state in which we can't improve things anymore. We've reached the maximum possible. So that's, again, a point that people who were accepted the part about always being motivated by pleasure, pain, wouldn't have to accept that we're always seeking some final state of contentment, which we never attain. But that was a point that Epicurus held, and uh, Mises followed him in that. Uh, if we're motivated by our long-term pleasure, Mises goes on to say, we need to cooperate with other people. We, could, we can greatly improve our chances of survival and thus having more pleasure in the long run if we do this. So if we don't cooperate with other people, we're not going to survive very well, very long. And if we don't survive, if we, we're just around for a very short time, then we won't be able to get very much pleasure. We'll just be around for just a few, uh, very brief space of time. So if we're interested in long-term pleasure, then we need to cooperate with other people. And by doing that, we can vastly increase our productivity through the division of labor. Uh, oh, here's, uh, again, from... This is from socialism, what Mises says about that point. He says, for liberal social theory, by liberal he means the classical liberal, the type of liberal that he, he was. For liberal social theory proves that each single man sees in all others, first of all, only means to the realization of his purposes, while he himself is to all others a means to the realization of their purposes. That finally, by this reciprocal action, uh, in which each is simultaneously means and end, the highest aim of social life is attained, the achievement of a better existence for everyone. As society is only possible if everyone, while living his own life, at the same time helps others to live, if every individual is simultaneously means and end, if each individual's well-being is simultaneously the condition necessary to the well-beings of the other, it is evident the contrast between I and thou, means and end, automatically is overcome. Uh, sometimes, as you see, Mises was given to rather long sentences although fortunately not always. But you see, in this passage, uh, Mises is 
directly attacking Kantian ethics, and he had in mind especially the uh, neo-Kantian philosopher Hermann Cohen, who said, uh, Kant says we ought to treat everyone as an end. Uh, and Mises is saying, no, we're treated, we have to treat everyone as both an end and a means. We're treating everyone else as, an, as a means to our end, but and everyone is treating us as means to his or her own end. So Mises, it, Kant thought uh, we should never treat anyone exclusively as a means, but Mises says we always do that. So there's a very strong contrast there between Mises and Kant. And I think it's interesting that in his epistemology, in his theory of knowledge, which you get in, in his development of praxeology, the science of human action, uh, Mises was very much under Kant's influence. But as far as ethics was concerned, he's completely the other way. He doesn't think much of Kant at all. He thinks that was definitely not the right way to go. Now, uh, this issue of pleasure versus duty that I've tried to emphasize was a main source of contention between the Epicureans and the Stoics, with the Epicureans arguing for pleasure and the Stoics for survival. In most cases, the two types of ethics will come up with similar practical advice. So the question then comes up, why does Mises emphasize the differences between the Stoics and Epicureans? Uh, the answer is that Mises thinks that the survival view leads to the position that there's an objective law of nature that tells people they ought to aim at their own survival. Uh, this is, in fact, what the Stoics believe. People ought to do their duty and act in accord with virtue because this is in accord with the law of nature. So you see, uh, this, uh, the, the Stoics would say you need to do certain things in order to survive, and that's your, your, what should be your goal. Now, Mises says, all right, uh, aiming to survive is, will enable you to maximize pleasure, but it isn't that you have a duty to survive even if you don't want to. It isn't that, uh, Somebody, suppose somebody said, well, I just don't care about survival. I want to end it all, or I prefer uh, acting to get the most pleasure now, even if it's going to destroy my life later, for example, by taking certain kinds of, of drugs. He might say, well, this will give me pleasure now, even if it very shortens my life, I'm going to do it anyway, Mises would say there's nothing one could say against that person except that most people don't have that view. Uh, so what Mises is most concerned to deny is that there's a, a object, the objective law of nature. According to him, all laws of nature are just descriptions of how nature operates. They don't say that nature ought to act in one way or another. If you said, uh, they, they, they just say, this is how nature is. So, it, as Mises sees it, reason can't tell you what you ought to want, but it has an instrumental role to play. It can tell people, if you want to get the most long-run pleasure, 
you ought to support social cooperation in the free market. Now, I'm not raising objection there. Doesn't this just reintroduce ought, in this case, as part of a hypothetical? Mises says there's no objective ought, but if, if can Mises consistently say if you want to get the most long-run pleasure, you ought to do such and such? Isn't that just putting ought back in when he said there aren't any objective oughts? But I think he can escape that objection by just saying social cooperation through the free market increases everyone's long-run pleasure. So in that way, the strict separation between descriptive and normative judgments is preserved. So nature, the laws of nature are purely descriptive. So when Mises says that the free market works better than alternative system, he's making a strictly scientific statement, not a subjective value judgment. Uh, but now we can identify the last step in Mises' argument. So we have that the scientific statement is that the free market uh, works better than alternative systems, and that if we want to maximize pleasure, we should have a free market. And the last step in the argument is that almost everyone does, in fact, want an abundance of material goods. Uh, so uh, everyone does, in fact, want an abundance of material goods for a long period of time. People who don't have this preference will tend to die out. Thus, the judgment, the free market will best satisfy the preferences of almost everybody, is not a normative statement. Uh, but an objective truth. It, because if it were a normative statement, then it would just be subjective. But he says, it's, no, it's an objective truth that the free market will best satisfy the preferences of almost everyone. But he says, if people don't want a life in which they're seeking well-being but prefer vegetative life, this is an ultimate value judgment. And praxeology, which is a value-free science, can say nothing against it. So if somebody was a complete, uh, just said, I don't care about uh, well-being at all, or material goods at all, Mises couldn't say anything. But he thinks that almost even so-called ascetics will compromise and uh, show that they are interested in achieving uh, uh, pleasure, so he, he tends to think that everybody will accept this. Uh, so I'd just like to finish with one final objection one might raise to Mises' position about ethics. When he says that, commenting on the ascetics, he says, the enticement of life triumphs. Isn't he saying that it's part of human nature to want to live? And in that case, isn't he a supporter of natural law despite his repeated nat opposition to natural law theories of ethics? But once again, he can escape this objection because Mises is not saying that people ought to act in accord with a life instinct, but simply that they, in fact, do so. He's not making an ultimate ought judgment, but keeping within the bounds of science. So I'm going to keep within the bounds of my time limit. So thank you.